But this time we want to share today regarding the dedication of the temple. Yes. That's what we want to talk about today, the dedication of the temple. Mm -hmm. And before we do that, I just want to open in a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Abba, thank you for thank your you, great Jesus. grace and mercy upon our lives. Thank you for your kindness, which so oftentimes, Abba, we fail to recognize. Yes. The scriptures teach us that in you we live, in you we move, in you we have our being. You are the sustainer of our breath. Yes, God. We would not have woken up this morning yes, unless you God. have given us breath. The atheists, although they reject you, yet do not realize the dependence they have upon you. Yes, right. Yes. That you supply them with breath every morning, giving yes. them opportunity yes. to yes. turn in repentance. Thank you, But Jesus. we thank you for your mercies. And ask that in the teaching that you would speak to the hearts of those assembled. Yes. That as I communicate, I ask Abba that you would speak. I'm just a man, <clears throat> but I'll be you are the creator. And may your great name be praised in everything that is done and accomplished. And we will bless you in the mighty name of your son, Yahshua. Amen. Amen. Praise the Holy One of Israel. Yes. Well, again, I'm so glad that each of you are here today to celebrate the Feast of Dedication. Hanukkah. I want to um, reiterate a little bit about what was read and I also want to talk about the temple. Um, so often times when a person hears the term temple, they relate it to a religious location of a deity yeah so oftentimes that's the idea that comes in someone's mm -hmm. mind you know someone might say well you know you've got the israelite folks in their temple and you've got the canaanite peoples in their temples and you've got the babylonians and the mitzrayim the egyptians and their temple you know, everybody got a temple. There ain't no, no difference in, you know, in and of temples. It's just an yes. old religious place. Yes, that's right. But this particular temple that the Most High told Moses to build. Yes. Was not just a temple just for the sake of having a place for his people to come to. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, that's the idea. I know when I first came into faith and that's the idea that I had in my mind because I did not hear a lot of teaching and information specifically about the temple no but what the Almighty told Moses to build and mm -hmm. I want you to hear me real clearly because when you get a picture of something in your head etch it begins to open up your understanding about yes, yes. certain things that are related to the Almighty. So, what the Almighty gave Moses was a layout of the temple where the Most High's throne is. That's actually what Moses constructed. Mm -hmm. And he told him, I want you to make this after the pattern of what you see. Moses was 40 days up on a mountain and he actually saw into the heavenlies. Yes, yes. Just like some other prophets did. But in heaven, how many of y'all ever heard of heaven? Everybody. Yes, yes. Out. <laughs> and sometimes we have these visual images of probably what it would be or look like. A lot of times you see clouds and all of this and pearly gates and all of that. But the temple is the prototype of the actual dwelling of the creator in that temple there is a menorah mm -hmm. it's a 
seven branch candlestick and it I don't know how tall it is in heaven but in the original temple that was built here on the earth and I better blow these out there we go <laughs> the original temple here on earth because that temple's been destroyed yes. but it's prophesied that it will be built again mm -hmm. the menorah stood about five or so feet mm -hmm. with seven branches going out and it represented what was in heaven by the throne of the <coughs> almighty my God in heaven. Did y'all hear me? In heaven. Yes, yes. There was also what's called an altar of incense. As you notice, we, we have some pictures up here that give some visual images of the different things that were in the temple. This one shows an altar with incense on it, coming yes. up from it. Yes. So we have like a little representation where we burn incense here. And the ancient church of the first couple hundred centuries burned incense mm -hmm. when they had their time of worship because it represented what was actually in the temple. When the priests would go into the temple, they would burn incense. Mm -hmm. In heaven, the Bible says, when you read in the book of Revelation, when John was yes. peeking into the heavens, mm -hmm. it said that there's an angel there and he had coals from the altar of incense in the heavens. Yes. And it says that the incense coming up represents the prayers mm -hmm. of the saints. Oh, God. So all of this symbolism, things that you see right here on this display, we do this because this is how it was done in the ancient times. My God. I know most churches don't do this. Mm -hmm. But we believe that the Most High is, supposed, is going to restore everything back to the original design according to prophecy. So we just assume we need to get in gear mm -hmm. and begin to do it. So there was an altar of incense. In heaven, there's an altar of incense. Mm -hmm. This depiction right here is of the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the commandments were placed. But also, all of the commandments that the Almighty gave to Moses, other than just the ten, he told him, okay, Moses, I want you to write all of these things that I'm telling you, all of these instructions, put it in a book, and then I want you to set it in a side compartment next to the Ark of the Covenant. There's commandments inside of it and on the side of it. Mm -hmm. Now you may wonder, why are you giving us all this description of this? Why is that important? Because the Ark of the Covenant represents the throne seat of the Creator. In heaven, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how that they saw the Ark and thundering and lightnings was coming out from it. Mm -hmm. This is the very throne, the seat of the Almighty. Sometimes it's called the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. And it has these two figurine angels. You can't see it that well from the picture there. But in heaven, the angels with their wings surround the presence mm -hmm. of the Almighty. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also in the temple, there is a table that had 12 flat loaves of bread mm -hmm. and these flat loaves of bread these 12 flat loaves of bread represented the 12 tribes of Israel yes yes what's the meaning behind that because all of that's in heaven too yeah what you start to see developing from this model prototype of the temple on earth, you start to get a visual understanding of what the plan of the Almighty is from heaven. Mm -hmm. 
Yahshua made a statement when he was teaching his disciples to pray. And he said, your kingdom come, your will be done. And y'all could probably finish this one. In earth as it is in heaven. Oh, glory. So what that says is that everything starts from heaven and then it's transitioned down to earth. So this temple that the Almighty gave to Moses, it wasn't just some temple that supposed to be a religious place yes. like any other temple. What the creator was doing, he was giving a model, a prototype uh -huh. of his home in heaven down on earth that yes. he yes. wanted to use through the house of Israel uh -huh. to be a witness to the entire world. Yes, yes. Those 12 loaves of bread. Mm -hmm. Somebody might say, well, man, you know, why has he got to be exclusive? Why does he want to just deal with only the 12 tribes of Israel? Mm -hmm. And other truth. That's, that's all he's dealing with is with the 12 tribes of Israel. Now you say, wait a minute, preacher. No, it's the whole world. Let me finish. When you read the prophecies of the prophets, mm -hmm. when the Bible talks about the regathering of the house of Israel, this is what the, the Most High says through the prophets. He said, when I gather together the outcasts of Israel, he said, I will gather others also to them mm -hmm. that are being gathered. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The plan of the Almighty was that he would use the house of Israel as his vehicle. Mm -hmm. And everybody who comes to faith in him become a part of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I thought, because I was taught this, mm -hmm. that we just the church made up of all nations. No, you the house of Israel made up of all nations. Let me prove it to you. The Bible says that in the final finale of it all, after man has been judged and the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire and those who are delivered will be eternally with the Almighty it says that there will be a new Jerusalem. Yes. Everybody say Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He didn't say a new Mecca. <laughs> he said there will be a new Jerusalem yes. coming out of heaven to the renewed earth. And there will be yes. renewed heavens. But check this out when you read the scriptures about this city of Jerusalem. What it says about it is that on the gates that are stationed mm -hmm. in the four different areas of entrance. We can mm -hmm. say north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. It says that upon the gates are written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Yes. And it says that all of the redeemed from all nations will come into it. Mm -hmm. So what we immediately start to understand is that redeemed mankind becomes mm -hmm. a part of the house of Israel. Right. There is no separate people mm -hmm. of the Most High outside of Israel. You know. What happens is that when you get saved, for those of you who have been saved, you become a part of Israel. That's right. yeah. That is how it works. So the Most High is not saying, I'm just dealing with Abraham's blood descendants and that's it. No. Uh, the Almighty said that if the stranger who desires to keep my covenant and my Sabbaths 
He says, if they will come after me, he says that they will have a special place with me. He said, I will give them a name greater than sons and daughters. He said, I will not despise anyone who comes after me yes, because right. the intent of the Almighty is for the redemption of the human race. Amen. My God. Yes. yes so in yes. given all that information about the temple mm -hmm. and the things in it, how the Most High wants to redeem man, we now look at what happened way back in 167 BC. There was a king who wanted all of his empire to worship the Greek deities. Yes. Such as Zeus, mm -hmm. Apollo. Mm -hmm. Yes. People who are familiar with what is called Greek mythology, they probably are familiar with some of those names. Mm -hmm. He wanted to push his religion. And he said, those who will not follow it mm -hmm. will be annihilated. Yes, yes. The culture of that time oppressed the way of the Almighty. Now, of course, this was before the Messiah came. Oppressed it so much so that there were Israelites who were circumcised that because of fear, they were uncircumcising themselves. Mm -hmm. There were mothers who had circumcised or had the children circumcised that they had found and they were slaughtering them because they would not submit to the pagan religion. My God. There was a great deal going on to completely stamp out the faith. Now one might ask, why? You know, every evil action that occurs in the world, those of us who believe the scriptures, we're told that all of that comes from a demonic kingdom. Mm -hmm. The apostle Paul made a statement and he said that flesh and blood or human beings are not your enemy. Mm -hmm. Now I know some of us still probably have a hard time with that because <laughs> it's kind of hard to separate the person doing the bad and doing the evil from the entity that gets in their mind and their spirit to do the evil. Yeah. We look at the person, no, nah, uh-uh. That's the thing. Yeah, you, no, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> but the scriptures teach us that there's something behind the person yes. that's inspiring them to do what they are doing. That's right. <laughs> well, there was a satanic entity called Lucifer mm -hmm. <laughs> that knew the prophecies of the Almighty. Yes, he did. That had read the books of Scripture mm -hmm. and knew about this Messiah that was going to come. Yes, right. Way before 167 B.C. even arrived, mm -hmm. <laughs> Lucifer was in heaven mm -hmm. with Elohim when he was planning out everything for mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. beings and knowing what human beings would do before they were created. He knew that man was going to disobey him. Yes, he did. <laughs> he already knew that man was going to fall. That's why the Bible tells us that Yahshua is the lamb slain from the creation of yes. the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, I just made those statements, but I want you to think about what that means. The lamb slain before the creation of the universe. Yes. That means that before the universe was even created, he was already slain. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> You know how sometimes you can read the Bible and you get so religious, you know. You read the Bible and you read what it says. You don't even stop to think, what does that mean? That's right. <laughs> what does it mean to be 
something before everything was created. Uh -huh. You mean tell me he died before he came into the world? He died before there was a creation? He was a lamb slain before everything was created? When you think about things or try to think about things from a level that's outside of our natural way of seeing things, we say spiritual. Yeah. It had already been taken into consideration that yeah, Yahshua right. was going to be the price paid to save yeah. human beings yeah, so that right. they could be restored that's before true. the Almighty even created that's true. anything. So, so Satan knew all of this stuff. Yes, he did. And from the onset, Satan said, you know what? I hate Yahuwah. <laughs> Listen, we need to have our plan in place so that we can mess up everything that he is doing. Mm -hmm. This was one of those instances where he got into this king Antiochus Epiphanes and said, look, we need to make all of these Israelites here convert to us, apostatize from their faith, or kill all of them. Now Antiochus didn't read the scriptures. He, you know, he wasn't really aware of all of the books of scriptures or all of the prophecies that this Messiah was to come from the line of Judah. He didn't know about all that. All he had in his heart was that we need to slaughter these people or absorb them into our way of living. However, Satan knew. Yes, he did. Because Satan knew that in 164 years or so, the Messiah was going to be born into the world. And so he was like, look, man, the prophecies is rolling its way on out. And time was running out. No. <laughs> it was running out. He knew Messiah was going to be born soon. Yes, he did. So he said, look, we need to get rid of these people. <laughs> How are you going to stop the Messiah from coming? <laughs> Kill the people that he's coming through. That's the only way to do it. <laughs> the only way we're going to stop this thing, we got to kill these people. We got to mess this temple situation up. We got to mess this whole thing up because the prophecy said when the Messiah comes, it says he's going to come to his temple. Mm -hmm. Read the prophecies. The devil knew the prophecies real good. Yes, he, did. he knows them better than all of us in here. Mm -hmm. He knew the plan. He said, look, we got to get rid of these people. We got to mess this temple up. We got to get rid of all of this. Because if this do come into the realm. Look, we already know what's been prophesied. We got to stop it. And the way things was going, the culture was so thick amongst the Israelites at that time, our ancient fathers. It was so thick that it looked like, it really, it looked like the Greeks was going to just absorb it all. I mean, yeah, it got so problematic that Antiochus was able to send his armies in, capture the temple, mm -hmm. steal all the gold from the articles that were in the temple, as has been read in Maccabees when our brother read it, where it says that they had to remake everything. They had to remake all of those things because all of that stuff was stolen. The gold shields and everything that decorated the temple. The Greeks came in and took all of that because that was ready. Do you know, you know how much gold mm -hmm. yeah. Solomon had put in that temple no when it was right. built? Mm -hmm. We can't even count the trillions. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can't even count the trillions. Mm -hmm. Solomon had everything overlaid in gold. Mm -hmm. He had, let, there wasn't just one menorah there. In the original tabernacle, the Most High said, just make one menorah. When Solomon got through, he had a number of menorahs <laughs> that was made and put in that temple. Mm -hmm. And so with all of this that was going on, yes. the culture almost overwhelmed the people. Yes. But a little remnant 
a remnant group decided, you know what? We got brothers who are apostatizing. They're leaving the faith. Mm -hmm. They want to be like the Greeks. Mm -hmm. It got to be so bad that you had Israelites that was going to the Greek Olympics. Now, I don't know if anybody in here really knew what the original Greek Olympics was like. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody know about the Olympics today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have y'all ever seen the statue of that man with the discus? Mm -hmm. And he looks nude, right? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> That's how they did the Olympics. That's how they did the Olympics in Greece. Mm -hmm. In the nude. And they did a whole lot of other things in the nude. <laughs> The culture was debauched in the sense that everybody did everything and they did everything with whoever they wanted to do it with. I won't go into any more detail because I know it will not be that appropriate for some of the ears that are here. Yes, right. Y'all are supposed to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but Greece was like that. That was the culture. But a remnant decided we need to dedicate ourselves to the Almighty and remain faithful to our faith. That's right. And they did that. The Most High was with them with a small little army. They were able to run the thousands and thousands and thousands of Greek soldiers out of their land. Now, the only way you can do something like that, you have to have the divine hand of the Almighty on your side to do that. That's right. And the reason why the Most High did that was because the Almighty had a prophecy that he had to ensure that would come to pass. See, these are those things a lot of times we don't see. The Almighty has always been at work throughout the generations of mankind so that when his Messiah would come into the world, he had to make sure that when all of the other little assignments and, and disruptions that Satan would bring to try and stop or try to thwart the plan, he had to make sure, look, I got to make sure there's a prophecy out there that I've spoken through a prophet. If I don't ensure that it comes to pass, that'll make me out to be a liar. Mm -hmm. Y'all understanding what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. See, the Almighty has spoken some things through some prophets like hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, if one thing happens to stop another then that would make the Almighty a liar. And he wasn't going to have that. Mm -hmm. Bible says, let Yahuwah be true and a man be a liar. So we find that the temple was rededicated. The temple. The place of redemption. It represents the place of restored fellowship with the Almighty. The Messiah came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said that no man can come to the Father except by me. He didn't say through Buddha. He didn't say through Krishna. He didn't say through any of the other pagan religions, he made it very, very exclusive. Mm -hmm. So for those who don't understand the exclusivity of this faith, I'm here to let you know. Based upon the book, the scriptures, there ain't no other way to get to the Almighty. No other way. Now I know other faiths would, would, would differ with that, and that's fine to differ with that. I'm just saying <laughs> that according to the books, I'm just saying, according to the books, you can read the books. Yeshua is the only way. He's the only way. Now, you can disagree with the books. You know, that's, that's the preference. Everybody has a preference.
preference to agree and disagree. Am I right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to fight nobody on their preference of agreeing and disagreeing. But the bottom line is that if you're going to accept the book, then you have to understand that the book says there's only one way. Only one way. And I can't compromise that as a teacher, mm -hmm. as an educator, mm -hmm. as a prophet. I, I can't compromise that. That's right. So one thing I've learned in my life, and that is that you have to be a person of truth. Whatever you think, feel, or believe, you have to be a person of truth. That's right. A person who studies archaeology and who studies history, they don't concern themselves with what this one thinks and what that one thinks or what they, they think for themselves. When they're looking for information regarding history and the past, all they concern themselves is with the evidence that they find. That's it. Mm -hmm. See, when people go to the Bible, they like to open up the Bible and import into the Bible their thinking. Yes, right. Their understanding. Their cultural way of seeing things. You can't go into this book and import those things that are relative to you. Yes. Because this book was written in an ancient time. From a different language. From a Hebraic culture. And so if you're going to understand what the book is actually saying. You need to go investigate those things. And when the information is rolled out. And the evidence is put before you. You just have to either accept it. Or reject it. What happens with most people is that with this book, because this book does not line up with what they want or what they perceive is right or their system of, of morality that they have chosen to embrace, they want to tweak the book yeah. <laughs> and make it say what they want it to say. Mm -hmm. Can't do that with this. No, you can't. We find in our age that there's a similar situation, just like in the Greek culture, when they came and overran the ancient fathers. We live in a culture much like that today. Yes, you say, how? How is our culture like the Greeks? Well, first of all, those of us who are part of the West, how many of y'all heard that phrase, the West? Mm -hmm. The foundation of the West was built upon the Greco-Roman system of government and philosophy. The Greeks were the first ones who came up with the concept of man is the messiah of all things. Have you ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. The Greeks were the ones who came up with the idea that if we choose not to believe in the gods, then they will not have any effect upon our lives because we determine our own destiny and we are the measure of all things. That same concept has permeated this culture in which we live today. Oh, I'm preaching good. <laughs> because our academic systems, our media fills our minds with this concept that you do you and I'm going to do me. How many times you ever heard that phrase before? <laughs> you know, when you hear something so often and so regular and it gets in your mind and in your psyche, what happens is that you begin to become accustomed to the idea. And you begin to embrace the idea without knowing it. So that you walk around and you begin to feel as though, just like the Greeks, I am the measure of all things. I determine the destiny for my life. See, the idea that the Greeks embraced was, it's all about you and you add this and you add that to make you better. You got a spiritual component. Get yourself some religion. It don't matter who you worship or who you serve. Just get your spirituality in place. That's a Greek thought. No matter who you exclusively worship, go ahead and get this and greet that. That's the Greek thought. Our culture in which we live today, our governmental system is based upon what? A democracy. 
We live in a culture that is more Greek than you and I even know. And the same ideologies in the Greek culture is in our culture today. So much so that the book that outlines how the people of the Almighty are supposed to live has been questioned, has been challenged, and has not been regarded. And so we live in an era much like that of the past. When we look into the scriptures, there's a different philosophy that the scriptures present to us. If you open up your Bibles in the book of Corinthians, the Apostle Paul made a statement and he said it like this. He says, your body, he said, is the temple. We've been talking about temples. Of Elohim and the Holy Spirit, which you have from Elohim, and you are not your own. Hold up, back it up. What did he, what did he say? You are what? Not your own. What, what is that? You are not your own. Uh-oh. That don't sound like what I'm used to. That don't sound like you do you and I do me. See, the culture that we live in has trained our thinking to cause us to believe that I do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I choose to do it. But the Creator, from the onset, taught human beings that you are made in the image and likeness of the Creator. And He said, I have given to you the freedom that you should govern the works of my hands. But it's not about you. You to serve my purposes. Scripture teaches us. And it says that we were created for his glory. All things were created for his glory. The age in which we live in today has challenged all of that. And each time we come to celebrations such as these, it's an appropriate time to reevaluate and say to ourselves that we may need to rededicate ourselves to the Creator. My God. <laughs> Because when you begin to see yourself <coughs> from a mindset that's different than what the Creator had intended, you're already on a slippery slope towards destruction. You may say, well, I don't see it like that. A lot of people have that ideology. I don't see it like that. You know, I feel like this about that. And I think like that about that. And of course, everyone is welcome to their own opinions. My God. Everybody has one, right? Mm -hmm. Just like eyes, nose, and ears, and everything else we got. Every, everybody has one. But folks, the difference is the creator, the sovereign one, has the last say about it all. Thank you, Jesus. And he is calling his creation to come back to him. A time is coming. I'm going to share it and then we're going to wrap this up. But there's a time that's coming where the Almighty is going to descend from his throne. Through the Messiah. The book says that when he descends from his throne, it's going to be like fire coming through the clouds. It says that the mountains are going to turn themselves to the side. The trees are going to be in fear. And he's going to descend and come down through all of the earth. And begin to move and bring judgment. You say, well, that sounds like a fairy tale to me. It might sound like a fairy tale to you. 
It might seem like one, but I tell you, when you see the most holy come, when you see the fire, the one whom the Bible says is a consuming fire, when you see him come, you begin to reflect on everything that you thought and the philosophies that you embrace, and you begin to recant those things because you begin to think that preacher told me that this was going to happen, that prophet told me that this was going to happen, and I didn't believe it, I didn't take heed to it, but now I am not in a place where I can be received by the Almighty yeah. because I chose not to believe. What a horrible disposition that's going to be. Thank you, Jesus. But the Most High is giving opportunity for those who He has made and created to return to Him. Thank you, Jesus. To dedicate themselves to Him. We're so grateful for what the Almighty has done, working miracles to preserve His promise. Yes, yes. But He's still working miracles. Yes, He is. He's still being merciful because He knows that there's a whole human race that He yet desires to redeem. Yes, He does. But He's not going to force humanity mm -hmm. to submit to Him. And he's not going to play by our rules. We might as well understand. Don't get it twisted. We don't make the rules. <laughs> he makes the rules. Yes. But his mercy that endures forever is such. Yes. Where he wants us to dedicate ourselves to him fully. And so today I want to challenge us. To consider ourselves, to consider our relationship mm -hmm. to the Creator. If you've never made a choice to sell out and give your all to Him, I challenge you to do that. Because the Almighty accepts nothing less but My full God. commitment. And He will wait, and He will wait, and He will strive. And his angel will be next to you. Y'all didn't know y'all have angels next to you. Oh, you? yes, we do. Do you know that you have angels next to you that record everything you do? Yes. That's speaking to you in your mind, in your thoughts, trying to tell you, you know what? You really need to get close to the Almighty. Yes. When you have this battle in your mind, because all of us have battles in our mind. Oh, yes. There's a battle of the world system, and there's a battle of the Almighty, constantly wanting to bring us to Him, constantly. And His angel is there, writing the information down, and ascending to the Father, and letting the Father know, Father, look, they're, 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 they're still there, they haven't really listened like they need to. Father said, go back down there and keep working with them. I'm still merciful. He's yet waiting. And waiting and waiting. Thank you, Jesus. See, he makes the rules. We don't make the rules. But because of his mercy, he'll tolerate our sin, tolerate our mess. He'll tolerate our disobedience. He'll tolerate our unbelief. He'll tolerate all of this stuff just for one day of repentance. Mm -hmm. He'll let, a, he'll let a person, wicked as all get out, live nine, not about to say 900, 90 years or so. Mm -hmm. For that one day that they will turn in repentance. Some of us, we say, man, you know what, man, they, they, I know they was wicked. <laughs> they did this, 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 and this, and that, that, that. No, no, man, just send them straight to the fire, yo. Send them. <laughs> Send them. <laughs> you know what the father says? Yep. But if they will turn at the last day, I'll take them. See, he loves us that much. He don't tolerate your mess. Don't get it twisted now. Some folk have been removed from the planet because they've done some stuff and kept doing some stuff. And the father said, okay, you disrespected me like that. Is enough. But my challenge to us is consider 
the message. Consider the voice of the Creator mm -hmm. and dedicate yourself to Him. I'm going to close on that note. Let us stand.